Fuel up. Don't sink. Young British pilots are earning their wings in the skies above Indonesia. Caution, terrain. It's Caution, one of the most dangerous terrain. places to fly in the world. Don't really want to get into the same situation as he did. It's high in the sky here, basically. With almost no aviation jobs in the UK, Brits with little flying experience are choosing to travel halfway across the planet to get their first pilot job. When you see something real like today, you do kind of want to put it out of your mind. The winds can really kick you up the ass. You feel like you don't have control. But putting their lives on the line stop, stop. could pay off big time and help them get their dream job with a commercial airline. Yeah, if anyone from BA recruitment is watching, I, I'm really keen to go back and fly in the UK. That cheeky little uh, air stewardess. In tonight's episode... Oh, yeah, we'll try a bit of Storm clouds and volcanoes push the pilots to their limits. I'll not have you go through this. Let's go over there. If we fly for an ash cloud, it could shut down the engine. And rookie pilot Nick has to deal with a plane flying too close for comfort. Traffic, traffic. We have no visual. It's got to be in the cloud somewhere. Somebody look out for traffic. Young British pilots joining the Indonesian airline Suzy Air find themselves facing up to the biggest challenges that exist in aviation. We have volcanoes to put up with every day. We have runways that could be little tiny mud strips on the side of mountains. Weather can change at any moment, even in like, like a few minutes. Dogs, pigs and people trying to cross the runway. It's scary as hell when something like that happens. But it's not just the extreme flying they must take on. Yeah, there's many things out in Indonesia that want to try and bite you, uh, get into bed with you. There's a lot of tropical diseases out here. We've got dengue, malaria, typhus. Basically, everything out here wants to get you. There have been 128 plane crashes in Indonesia over the last 20 years. But despite the country's poor aviation record, intrepid airline boss Susie has built a company worth millions of pounds. All I need is that the crew is ready to fly above 100 hours every month. She's one of the most powerful women in Indonesia and is renowned for her no-nonsense approach. Susie is definitely uh, not the sort of person you want to cross. Um, yeah, if you cross Susie, she will come down here like a, like a ton of bricks. Susie started out with just two planes. Ten years later, she has nearly 50, flies to 168 destinations across the country, and has a constant demand for new pilots. Susie Air is the best choice that a new, fresh graduate pilot could ever get in the world. If they're prepared to accept the risks that come with flying out here. Today, 28-year-old Captain Dave Burns is flying some of Susie's most valued passengers. We've taken out some seats at the back of the aircraft here, ready to go and pick up 13 boxes of uh, fresh live lobster from the island of Simlu. His family were dead set against his move to Indonesia. My parents were like, oh, what are you doing? It's, it's a dangerous country. There are many aviation accidents in Indonesia. We don't want you to go for the job. Having left behind careers as a car salesman and as a burger flipper, Dave's ultimate goal now is to fly a jumbo jet back home. But he also shares Susie's money-making ambitions. My long-term goal is to earn loads of money, uh, live in a nice house and just fly a big plane and have a hot wife. But <laughs> at the moment, I'm, I'm putting up with Susie uh, can you just make sure that's locked for us? Flying from Maidan on the northern island of Sumatra, 
Dave will be picking up the lobsters 300 miles to the west from the island of Simelu. But a build-up of heavy clouds at the destination is preventing him from taking off. They're not allowed to land unless they can see the airstrip from five kilometers away. We've got the battle with the weather to see whether we, um, whether our aircraft is going to successfully land once we get to Simulu visually. Dave knows only too well how badly things can go wrong for pilots in Indonesia. My time in Susie Air, we've been through three accidents and I've, I've lost friends um, being killed in plane crashes. Number one, the aircraft was overweight and they were flying towards a high mountain range and the aircraft just couldn't climb over that mountain range. Accident number two, one of the local tribal guys was walking across the runway who was apparently deaf and couldn't hear the plane coming. Number three, my good friend died in that accident. When the aircraft had a fuel problem, he was only 100 meters away from safely landing on the road. It's, it's a realization about life and that how you're not invincible and how anything can happen. The lobsters are a huge moneymaker for Susie, but have to be delivered fresh. So despite the threat of poor visibility, the airplane dispatcher is under pressure for them to be collected as soon as possible. He's come out personally. He's come out personally, so there's going to be an issue. Hi, Danny. I want you must landing yeah, in Simulu, yeah? Because it's impossible, this lobster flight with me, okay? It's not, you're not landing. Problem with me. Okay, I want to speak to Charles before we make that decision. If I don't land and I don't get the lobsters, then the lobsters aren't going to be fresh, and this is the pressure that we have. The captain has responsibility for making the final call on whether it's safe to take off. Yeah, dude. What's, what's the weather exactly? He says the weather is uh, at least five kilometers, which is completely legal for us to fly. Um, so I've just called boarding and we're going to pick up the lobsters. Once in the air, Dave has to navigate another major hazard pilots often experience flying from Maidan, bird strike. If you could keep out the birds for me. If a bird ends up going through the engine, then we could have an engine failure and be preparing for emergency landing. Bird strikes are a real threat to flight safety. A forced emergency landing in the jungle-covered terrain would almost certainly lead to casualties, if not deaths. Without the advanced technology you would find on a jumbo jet, it's down to the pilots to visually navigate their way through any hazards. It's very tricky, very, very tricky. It takes a lot of skill. When you compare it to the airliners uh, back at home, uh, there's a lot more hands-on flying. And also, unlike the big jet airliners, they get no support from air traffic control on landing. Uh, because these airports have no instrumentation to help us land, so it's literally our feet, our hands, and our own eyes. Despite the bird strike threat and the visibility issues, Dave safely navigates his way into Simelu and Susie's urgent lobster cargo is waiting on the tarmac. So we've arrived to pick up our little passengers. Keeps on growling at me. One kilo of these lobsters is 27 pound, and today we're carrying 280 uh, kilos back to Medan, ready to go onto the dinner plates around Asia. So uh, we better make sure they have a safe flight back to Medan. Airspeed is alive. 60 knots. But there's a problem. Dave's weather radar is warning him of storm clouds gathering off the coast of Sumatra, moving towards his intended path. Only a few weeks ago, a similar small plane crashed in Indonesia, killing.
killing all four people on board after a lightning strike broke off the plane's wing. We have all these build-ups and storms started building right the way along the coast. So we need to make sure we stay away from these storms at a safe, to safe distance. What makes matters worse is the storms blowing in from the east, forcing Dave to navigate too close for comfort to one of Indonesia's active volcanoes. Mount Sinabung last erupted just three weeks ago, blowing thick volcanic ash into the air for miles around. These ash clouds can be catastrophic to aeroplanes. If we fly for an ash cloud, if it is a very dense ash cloud, it could, it could shut down the engine and we would never get the engine back and then we would have problems. With no pressurized cabin on the Cessna to maintain oxygen levels, they can't fly high enough to go over the clouds. With only basic instrumentation, they'll have to navigate through the storm by sight, looking for gaps in the cloud to see the terrain ahead. The volcano is slightly to the right there, so let's go over the original plan for Dhaka while also checking there are no planes in their path. Okay, let's go slightly to the left. Let's go through that gap there. Okay, yeah, to the right, please. Just, yeah, let's head through that. I'm not happy going through this. Let's go over there. Okay. Okay. No, I know. Go up there. This. Having made it past the volcano, Dave now finds the storm closing in as he approaches the airport. to some skillful maneuvering and nerves of steel, the plane and its cargo reach their destination. We got back safely. The problem is the heat builds up in the afternoon. It builds and builds and builds and just turns into thunderstorms across Sumatra. The, um, the area of Sumatra between the Indian Ocean and the Malacca Strait is just one big heat machine that just generates the worst storms in Indonesia. All of the pilots at Suzy Air have to come to terms with the risks that come with their job every time they get into a plane. It's a challenging experience flying for Su Suzy Air because we have to deal with all kinds of dangers every single day. Indonesian airline Suzy Air perform a vital service connecting the remote communities in the mountainous province of Papua. But the flying here is some of the most testing and dangerous in the world. Only Suzy Air's most experienced pilots are allowed to tackle these deadly skies. Well, this one's going to potentially pull the airplane apart. Doesn't matter how good you think you are, wind will get you, something will get you. 34-year-old Matt Dearden's former career in IT could not be further from his experiences in Papua. Back in UK, it was uh, all looking rosy, you know. It was uh, pretty well paid, a couple of cars, a flat in Bristol. It was, uh, on paper, looking pretty sweet, but, yeah, I just, I just wasn't happy with it. It was mundane, and I figured this is uh, maybe not what I want to do for the rest of my life. At the age of 30 and with minimal flying experience, Matt took a huge gamble and left behind the stable life he had built in the UK. They gave me 10 days notice, so it was a 10-day blitz to try and get everything sorted out, pack my life into a suitcase, and head out to Indonesia. The first night was a sort of sleepless one, really, just 
mulling everything over. God, what have I done? You know, packed in everything back home. This is just going to be a massive mistake, and I'm going to have to borrow some money for a flight back home. <laughs> Matt's delivering rice and cooking materials from his base in Tamika to the remote village of Taput, 3,000 meters up in the mountains. For most of the tribal peoples of Papua, contact with the outside world was only made in the 1950s. And the majority of them still live very traditional lives. Many of the locals here, a lot of them haven't even been in an aeroplane. I mean, some of them just sit on the floor, they sit on each other. So, you know, you get them in a seat and then you show them how to use a seat belt, how to open it again. It's uh, looking pretty windy out there as well. It's uh, certainly picking up down here and just looking out on the ridges uh, in the distance there, actually the clouds building. So I suspect it's going to be uh, a bit of a bumpy one. The high terrain surrounding Tuput is notorious for causing turbulence. And strong winds on the final approach can make landings treacherous. Hi, Victor, 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 and mountain captains don't have the luxury of a stewardess or even a co-pilot if any of them are thrown into panic by the experience of being 10,000 feet off the ground. Passengers are mixed. Some of them just think it's fun and they're sort of whooping and hollering and kind of thinking it's like a roller coaster. Uh, some of them, it's a little bit scary for them. The weather on the journey is soon bad enough to worry Matt, let alone his nervous passengers. As you can see already, there's a lot of cumulus clouds building up. We don't want to be flying in those things. We want to get those ones a uh, wide berth, certainly in a small airplane like this. Cumulus clouds can build into thunderstorms, which can be incredibly dangerous to small planes like these single-engine porters. Certainly, uh, it's happened before. Wings will come off. That sort of thing. That's the way it goes. I hear Papa takes no prisoners. We'll see how it goes. Fingers crossed it's not too bad. As he nears his destination, Matt finds himself being thrown around. Turbulence is the number one cause of serious injury in planes, and has even led to the death of passengers thrown around by its force. got through the turbulence, Matt now has to worry about landing safely. Hey, see we've got a hell of a cross one actually. To fight the strong crosswind, Matt is forced into a side-on crabbing approach. If he doesn't straighten up at the exact point of landing, he could run off the side of the runway. steady hand gets the terrified passengers safely onto the ground. I was happy I guess that was a little bit scary for us, but uh, they should just be happy to be on the ground, really. With their ordeal over, the Dani women are reunited with their loved ones. decisions on hiring and firing ultimately lie with no-nonsense airline boss, Susie. That's your problem. Maybe people are always nervous to see me. Many of my pilot things, I, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I'm joking, I'm not going to bite you, so come closer. <laughs> and she's just summoned Captain Dave Burns for a meeting at the company HQ. I received a message saying that Susie wanted to see me. Uh, for an interview for a management position with Dan. Although, <laughs> you don't really know what these uh, interviews are about. Whether I'm in trouble, whether I've done something wrong, whether I'm being praised, whether I'm being promoted. You never know in this company. Are you nervous? Yeah, I am quite nervous. The previous time Dave was summoned to see Susie, he was suspended from duty. 
I was temporarily fired for a couple of weeks. Uh, it was really uh, something you could describe as a cultural difference between the uh, a, between the Western world and Indonesia. Being a Brit abroad, Dave managed to make such a huge cultural gaffe that Susie immediately hauled him to Jakarta for a telling off he'd never forget. Susie is quite tough to deal with. I'm going to find you another $50,000. You, you've got to stay on the good side of her. She's, she's very, very vocal about what she wants. You cannot deliver your service. He needs to impress his boss because a bad reference could damage his chances of his dream job with a UK airline. Dave is a special uh, character, so uh, we, we had some uh, bit uh, bad experience with him. Fire or fire? Who knows? As with all of Susie's business affairs, the interview will be held in strict privacy. My hands are all sweaty now. I told him once, I say, watch, watch your behave so you don't screw up your future. We see from the interview what he will do to convince me that the position is, is for him. Dave will have to wait until the end of the week to hear her decision. Susie Air HQ is also where the new recruits receive their training. 26-year-old former professional poker player Nick Holmes has gambled his life in the UK for the chance to train as a pilot with Susie Air. Failure isn't an option. There's no other job waiting for me back at home or anywhere else. So far, Nick has struggled on his test flights. Oh. A bit too much? Yeah. Oh, oh shit. So a bit fast. Pitch up, pitch up. Pitch up. Oh, no, 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 no. Not demonstrate that again. If this doesn't work, then I have no idea what I could do. Today, it's judgment day. After just six weeks of training, Nick's taking his final test flight, which will determine whether or not he'll get the job. The flight assessments that we do are very important. If a pilot does badly during flight training and he cannot land the airplane uh, comfortably and nicely, he will not go on uh, and, and be uh, a line pilot. To pass the test flight, Nick must show alertness of all potential dangers. The warning signals another plane is close enough to threaten a mid-air collision. With no radar to guide them, they must find the danger with their own eyes before it is too late. To complete the test, Nick will have to conquer something he struggled with throughout training, landing the plane. When we fly passengers, they judge the entire flight, they judge the entire company based on how the touch time was. So it's very important that our pilots are able to touch down the caravan without bouncing it uh, and without uh, making the passengers feel unsafe. Caution, terrain. Okay, look up. To land safely, Nick must maintain the right height and speed of approach by pitching the plane at the correct angle. Left. Oh. Don't say full. You have to look. When I say oh, left, yeah. you need to check it. And I don't look here. Look at the white one. If he gets it wrong, Nick will have to decide whether to abort the landing or risk stalling and crashing. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. Don't chop the power before you get to the plane. Left rudder, left rudder. Ah, I have control. Control. Safely back on the ground, Nick will now find out if he's graduated. 
the flight was challenging and uh, I was a little bit confused about exactly the way things should be done and yeah a bit disappointed that I didn't quite get it. Nick didn't do 100% so he needed prompting and reminding um, just because he was getting a bit overloaded. So to sum things up your final flight it was okay mm. it wasn't great uh, a couple of times I see you sort of freezing up and busy flying the aircraft yeah that will be fixed you've passed the the flight training before flight was the last uh, well done great despite some mistakes Nick has managed to qualify as a co-pilot he'll be behind the controls of a plane full of passengers in just four days time in the bag he needs to dramatically improve or his fledgling aviation career could be over Computer programmer Matt Dearden jacked in his job four years ago to become a mountain pilot in one of the most remote regions of the world. Once he started flying out here, his priorities shifted dramatically. I came out to Indonesia with aspirations, as most pilots do, to get some hours up and then head back to Europe and go flying for one of the airlines there. But, you know, within a few months of being out here, I thought, this is way more interesting than like, being back in Europe. Why would I want to go back and do that, you know, when I can have this adventure lifestyle out here. His job delivering supplies to cut off communities provides him with an opportunity to see a way of life few people get the chance to experience. This is the last frontier. Here I am in the absolute wilderness. You know, you've got naked guys walking around with penis sheaths and, and spears and bows and arrows. And it was like, hell yeah, I want a piece of this action. Today, he's delivering supplies to Tuput. A village of around 50 Dani people survives on hunting and highland farming. So these irregular supply drops are an important supplement. Just kind of helping the people develop out here, it's, it's, it's hugely satisfying being able to do that. So, mungkin minggu depan ada terpanor tangan lagi. Sekarang terkau. Semuanya charter sekarang. The guys asking me when we're going to come back again. I don't know at the moment, so I just said to him, maybe next week, maybe next month. And he's like, okay, we'll, uh, we'll wait for you to come back. Matt's keen interest in the tribal people means he's happy to accept an invite to the local village. For his job, Matt has learned Bahasa, the national language, but there are 300 languages spoken amongst the tribes of Papua. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Papa. Oh, wow. Obviously, for small people, this place. Wow, that's awesome. Salamat, sore, samoya. Sore. Wow, fabulous, yeah. Very primitive life. It's, you know, they got the fire here. They got a little bit of vegetables hanging up over there. And uh, that's about it, eh? No Sky TV here. Yeah. So, masak di atas apa? Yeah, ini biasa taruh belanga pakai ini. Ini taruh belanga baru masak. Masak apa? Masak. Uh, ubi, sayo, uh, nasi. Um, this is the first time I've actually uh, gone in one of these uh, little huts. You know, I fly over them all the time. So, yeah, this is awesome to actually uh, to come and meet some of the people and actually uh, check out how they live. It's uh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, he's just saying that uh, I'm actually the first uh, white person who's actually uh, ever come into their village and into one of their little huts here. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool privilege. <laughs> For me, the ultimate kick flying a Papua is going to kind of new new places I've not been to before. I, I love doing that. I love just finding somewhere new. <laughs> Having finally graduated from the Suzy Air Flight School in Java, 26-year-old Nick is about to start his first posting in Maidan on the island of Sumatra. I have no idea where I'm going. <laughs> I figured I'd just walk around, see if I can see uh, people who might be from Suzy Air. No thanks. Nick 
Nick's only had a few hours in-air flight training with Susie Air, but now he's taking the massive step up to flying their passenger planes. I am nervous about flying on the line because it's not going to be the same as the training. I want to appear to be confident and competent. I do worry that the captains will think, oh, this guy doesn't know anything, but I think realistically we can't be expected to know everything. To add to the pressure, he's flying from the huge international airport of Kuala Namu, the second busiest in Indonesia, where he'll be sharing the runway with the big airliners. All new co-pilots are mentored by experienced captains. Nick will be under the watchful eye of Canadian Captain Jeff Lamb. All the co-pilots have different experiences when they're new. Uh, some are lazy, some are hardworking, some are trying too hard. Um, so I can't wait to find out. <laughs> Nick will be flying to a strip that has a notoriously tricky final approach. Pretty nervous about this uh, first flight. Uh, I was looking in the route guide and it said recommended captains perform this approach. It's going to be quite challenging. He's flying 230 miles to Ai Godang Airport in the center of Sumatra. Okay, uh, before taxi check this, please. Uh, go ahead. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. You have to remember. You have to look at that. Taking the huge step up to being responsible for all his passengers' lives is a lot of pressure. And Nick momentarily forgets what his job is. Uh, weather's a bit hazy, stay visual. Uh, operationally standard takeoff. And threats, uh, my first flight as a passenger. Uh, as a passenger? Uh, as a passenger. As a passenger. As a passenger. As a passenger. Fortunately for Nick, his maiden passenger flight is blessed with the calmest weather Indonesia can offer. But there are other things to worry about. The airstrip is surrounded by mountains, so Nick will have to make a steep descent before banking sharply into the final approach to the runway. Stay visual, look outside. The runway is over there. For a jet. Look outside. You're flying in a lot of terrain. Yeah. You have to keep your eyes outside. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the approach looks really quite straightforward. It might not be, but... <laughs> You're a little bit low. Timing the touchdown, Nick's passengers get a much bumpier landing than usual. The heart rate started to climb up just a tad, yeah, just a little bit. It was probably one of the, not the best landings I've had, even in experiences in Africa. She was a bit over to one side, so that's one I will not be telling the wife about, that's for sure. Oh, that way landing was terrible. Yeah, it was kind of a baptism of fire, you could say. But, uh, yeah. We walked away from it. Could have been worse. Above all else, Nick did manage to deliver his passengers in one piece. But in Tamika, Papua, mountain pilot Matt's cargo is far more likely to cause a problem if there is a bumpy landing. Pilots in Papua often find themselves delivering essential yet highly flammable fuel supplies. Fuel drums, these are full of diesel. They uh, count as a dangerous good. So uh, we have to actually have an extra Extra bit of paperwork for this one. To help Indonesia's most remote communities become less isolated, some roads have been built between them. But the roads are useless if there isn't fuel to power the vehicles. You want to be absolutely sure the, uh, the cap is all on there secure. You get a bit of fuel leaking out, and that's not a pleasant thing at all. Um, you want to have the uh, windows all open and even go on the oxygen if you need to. Um, you know, fumes in the cabin, really, really not good. Passing out from the fumes is not the only concern. Because of the air pressure changes, what happens is they slowly expand, and as they expand, you get uh, the drum will sort of make a 
hell of a bang. Uh, the first time you fly with them is very unnerving. to the Moni village of Bilai, 25 miles from Matt's base. The strip at this village was the site of a crash landing two years ago. Matt does a fly pass to check the landing strip is clear to avoid making the same mistake, especially loaded with barrels of diesel. Right, there's a lot of people on the left right here in Bilai. I can actually see them walking down the airstrip. Just come in a little bit and let them know we're here. Oh, bloody hundreds of them. People on the airship is not something you want at all. Um, they're, they're hitting a person with an aircraft and potentially also it'll kill the person, but uh, potentially cause the aircraft to lose control as well. Sometimes they just don't learn, you know. Aircraft of people are not safe. You know, they've got to keep out of the way. Okay, it looks nice and clear now, they've actually moved off to the side. Just land past those guys. Matt's careful landing means he and the much needed fuel have both arrived safely. Yeah, health and safety would love this. With the diesel unloaded, Matt takes the opportunity to investigate an all too real reminder of what happens when things go wrong. This plane may be worth millions of pounds, but it was a write off when it crash landed here and it was left to rot on the strip. This is what's left of the fuselage of this aircraft. Um, there's no instruments left, no seats. Most of the panels are missing, the engine's gone. All the wheels, undercarriage, it's all, oh yeah, it's all gone. You know, on top of this would have been a, a sort of an upper section, um, which I think I caught an eye of over there somewhere. I think they're using it for something else. Given the village's lack of resources, it didn't take long for the crashed plane to be put to good use. This is the top of the uh, fuselage here. Painted a rather fetching green by the looks of it. A little hut for his, uh, for his scooter there. Oh wow, yeah, so these are the, uh, these are the wings of the aircraft. Um, obviously now the walls of this little hut. It's never going to use them as an aircraft wing again, so yeah, might as well be the wall of the house. <laughs> so one minute this thing's flying the sky as a pathway, you know, delivering whatever it needs to. Next minute it's uh, the garage for someone's moped. <laughs> Funny old word. Matt's had four years to adjust from working in IT to flying in Indonesia, and the experience has completely changed the way he sees himself. I really do feel like I'm, I'm a different person. It's, it's basically, you know, I've gone from a normal kind of bloke just doing a normal kind of job back in a normal country, and now I'm, I guess, slightly crazy bloke doing a crazy job in a pretty crazy country. And mountain pilot Matt couldn't be happier with the change search for the perfect job is over. Papua is just the last frontier. It's, it's the ultimate adventure, really. I don't want to fly 737 for Ryanair or for Airbus for EasyJet or whatever. This is proper flying. This is the real deal. This is what I actually want to do with my life. You know, I mean, I'm 34 now, so you start thinking about the future. Could I do this forever? I mean, from a fun and like selfish point of view, yeah, I mean, I probably could. It's, it's awesome. Fucking 
Still at the very beginning of his career, rookie co-pilot Nick has so far only made one rather bumpy passenger flight with Susie Air. The pressure is on for him to show a marked improvement. I'll go up to camp, please. Beat, check, left 10 selected. On his second flight, he's being mentored by Captain Dave Burns. Nicholas Holmes. <laughs> Nicholas Sherlock Holmes. Oh my God, your surname's Holmes and you remind me just like Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch is a knob. <laughs> For the return leg, Nick will be taking the controls. I've just heard like the landings might be an issue, which is which is pretty much the uh, <laughs> the most important part. But we we've we've got a game sorted. We need him up to speed. So that's the aim of the game today. Oh, ready as it'll ever be. No big deal. You know. <laughs> well, I say that now. <laughs> But Nick's flying skills are about to come under intense scrutiny. <laughs> A VIP and his entourage are unexpectedly joining the flight. How are you? Fine. He's a special envoy to the Indonesian president, the most powerful man in the country. If the pilot is a uh, white man, Oh, they, are, they, are, they really, really trust the pilot. <laughs> Dave suddenly realizes their trusting passenger is a personal friend of their feared boss, Susie. Right, we've, got, we've, got to be, uh, we've got to be good on that speakers of this guy. This, this guy, no, Susie, I know who he is now. Dave doesn't want to do anything to upset boss Susie, so he'll be keeping a very close eye on Nick. He's had your pressure on to Nick. He's going to make it as comfortable as possible because otherwise this guy will tell Susie and he'll get fired. <laughs> oh, no pressure or anything. No pressure or anything. Traffic. Traffic. It's okay. Continue. It's just police helicopter yeah. on the right there. Keen to keep Susie's business contact, the special envoy happy, Dave offers Nick as much advice as possible. Because we're quite heavy on the back, because it wants to flare, just don't. Just push it out forward and just land. And just maintain 85. <laughs> He's happy with it? That's good. A little bit up and down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very soft. Yeah. The landing wasn't the prettiest, but uh, everything else is okay. And the landing, I can always make that better. He, he was absolutely fine, so I, I've been with much worse. Having finished the week's flying without any serious <laughs> incidents, the Suzy Air team can afford to let off some steam. Dave has been waiting patiently to hear news about the job he went for as a base manager. Um, I haven't been offered the base manager's job, but I've been offered the deputy base manager's job. I think Susie likes my feistiness for some reason. She, she likes the fact that how I was nearly fired nine months ago, and somehow we've just had a complete turnaround. <laughs> Nick's also celebrating. He's now well on the way to being accepted as a fully-fledged Susie Air pilot but he's still coming to terms with taking passengers' lives into his hands. Actually flying passengers is interesting. I think it actually negatively affects my flying, you know? It's that little extra bit of pressure. But uh, it can only get better. I don't think it can get much worse anyway. <laughs>
After getting the thumbs up from boss Susie, Dave is settling into his new job as deputy base manager. This is our ticketing department. Yes. Busy at all times. <laughs> Good. That's what we want. I think I base my management style on Richard Branson. He's very relaxed. He has lots of different ideas, but most importantly, he's a go-getter. And I hear he's a very good communicator. Have we made much money today? <laughs> that means no. He's hoping that his new position will take him a step closer to moving back to Britain for his dream job as a jet pilot. I fire CVs to companies that um, operate big jet aircraft. So here we've got everything from Aer Lingus, we've got Cathay Pacific, Dragonair in Hong Kong, Emirates, Etihad, uh, all, all. Literally, I've covered a lot there, a lot. But he has never got past the interview, and his dream seems as far away as ever. It's, it's a bit disheartening when you send them all out and you don't really hear stuff back, but there's just so many pilots out there that need jobs, so you've just got to never give up. Never, ever give up. It's still a very long way from me being home. A very, very long way. Next time. Look at the speed of that. Pilots deal with the terrors of rush hour in Papua. Traffic, traffic. Watch out for this guy. And an election dispute gets out of hand. We got to get out of here. Once there's blood, that's it. 10 o'clock next Tuesday for Worst Places to Be a Pilot. 9 o'clock tomorrow night, brand new Grand Designs and a build that'll have us all on the edge, the cliff's edge. Next tonight, when jazz cigarettes get in the way of running a hotel. A clear head, a key ingredient in Ramsey's Hotel Hell.